Welcome to the latest rendition of my uh, Sears webinars at Epic, uh, Epic Street. Thank you very much, everyone at Epic Street, for making this event possible. Let me start with a reminder that the purpose of this, of this event is education. I'm not going to provide specific trade alerts or recommendations. Um, well, I can put it simply, I, I hope to give you some things to think about, some things to consider, maybe some things to research, and all the while uh, taking a look back at the... Um, the trading day that has just been completed, at least the European trading day that is over now. And we'll take a look ahead at what, mod, what tomorrow might bring. I'm going to talk about uh, tr two main trades. Two Actually, I can talk about more than two, but uh, I'm going to specifically address two different currency pairs. Two different currency pairs. You can probably guess what one of them is because I've covered this one's currency pair so much. Uh, so, and that's the big clue. It's a currency pair that I've covered a lot in recent webinars. I've covered a lot in my recent New York session video reviews. And if any of any boot campers here, you know I've been covering this pair a lot in the live class as well. The other pair I haven't talked about as much, but uh, you, hopefully you'll, you'll see um, as I go through an explanation of the um, basis for a trade on the second currency pair. Hopefully you'll understand why I picked that pair. And actually, that pair is a great example of uh, something of a common set to illustrate later. So yeah, so Euro's right. Euro USD is one of them. Uh, I'll let uh, I can start my discussion with the Euro USD in today's price action, and uh, whether it's now or when I finish my discussion on the Euro USD, I encourage all of you to uh, take a guess and maybe even <laughs> maybe even ignore some of my discussions on the Euro, especially if you know that what happened if you traded it and such, and uh, look around and see what other pair I might be talking about. We had a you know, notable move, a very interesting uh, setup. For I I don't want to give it too many clues I'll give it away but uh, yeah another pair a, a very uh, nice um, technical setup for a trade today so uh, with that let's get on to the euro here you should see my cursor yeah the cursor is all good I'm going to start with this we're going to look back at price action from yesterday's sell off. I don't want to do that. I want to turn off the uh, auto scroll, and I I'm, I want to go to a short. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stick with this time frame. I was thinking about going to a short time frame, but this this will do. This will do. And actually, I like this because the uh, uh, I mean, maybe omit some of the uh, or delete some of these lines. Some of these lines can may come into play later, in days to come possibly. But I want to keep the focus on. Um, a spatch of the latter part of yesterday's uh, sell-off on the euro. So I'm looking at euro price action through, let me get this down to, about the end of the uh, New York trading day there. So what you see is the meat of the sell-off yesterday, the, the, the lion's share of the sell-off yesterday on the euro, starting with the, um, uh, the bigger dip down after the, uh, Actually, it was right in here. I should note right in here that it was announced uh, during our Coach David Pegler session. This was between. This was just after 2 a.m. New York time yesterday. It was announced about right in here by LCH Clearnet that they would raise margin requirements on um, Italian bonds across the board. But it wasn't until the New York, I'm sorry, the London session opened that the sell on really took off. So uh, what I'm looking at, especially, is price action after the first leg down of sell off. You know, where did the where did price action pause? Where did the euro sell off pause? And a couple of points caught my attention um, during the sell off yesterday. One, and it's an area we've talked about before, was the 3660 area. That's represented by the horizontal green line on this chart. 3660, Roy reversal. We talked about that scenario, I believe, during yesterday's webinar. I mentioned it in my New York session video review. Actually, we didn't even get there today, so that's uh, uh, the last you'll hear me mention, should hear me mention, the 3660 area. Now, another area that caught my attention was a look at how much time the euro, you should see my cursor hovering next to this, look at how much time the euro spent uh, uh, finding a floor, so to speak, at 36.25. Let me highlight that with a couple arrows for uh, for emphasis. Which, by the way, we eventually broke past, broke below, and then I'll, I'll highlight with a downward pointing arrow how we retested that area. So you actually had another dose of roll reversal at 36.25. And by the way, folks, this is fairly common. This is it's actually a very valid way to trade 
uh, an aggressive sell-off. First of all, when it, ha when it comes to whether it's an aggressive sell-off or a, an aggressive uh, rally, you have to have some reasons to believe that the so-called pullbacks are going to be relatively shallow. Do you know, do you know do you everyone understand what I mean by that when I refer to shallow pullbacks? Let's talk about the bounce from this blue line. That bounce up from about 36.25 to the green line at 36.60, and that would, that's what I would call a fairly shallow retracement, a shallow pullback. A deeper pullback, a deeper retracement would have gone up further to say 137, maybe even higher. 37.20, 37.30, you get the idea. It would have gone up more and then continue down. But in this case, it was a fairly shallow pullback. And as, as I see it, this is given the way I trade. Uh, there's, 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 you can use some technicals to to dictate to help you guide you as to when you should be aggressive or not. I personally, I personally find that I the um, the news flow and, and fundamentals more uh, more helpful to me. I I let news dictate for me when I'm and no, I could, actually let me clarify a combination of price action or news plus price action. Uh, helps me, helps guide me as to when I'm going to be aggressive or not. So news plus price action helps me decide when, and of course when it comes to the news part of it, you have to understand, uh, you know, when some, when some news comes about, when some news hits the market, that's important or not. And you know, that, that can take time to acquire. It can take time to acquire the understanding of, uh, you know, when, 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 what's a game changer? What's a, what's a significant piece of news? That could prompt the market to to sell aggressively or to or to be bought or I should say appear to be sold aggressively or appear to be bought aggressively. And I you know I I do think that today I did sorry yesterday yesterday was a a valid situation there to to assume that there could be some uh, a continuation of some aggressive selling. Not every day that Italian bond yields uh, surpass seven percent and the uh, a major clearinghouse uh, raises bond term requirements on um, on bond yields. Anyway, uh, so there's um, that was that's something that uh, that came to light uh, yesterday. And what I talked about during yesterday's uh, uh, my coaching session at FX Bootcamp yesterday is even if you didn't trade that, even if you didn't trade something like that, rather there's there's different ways traders can use their time, can expend their energy. I, I know plenty of traders who who still to this day I believe and those in bootcamp, some bootcamp for example, not many, but. A few, far fewer now than used to be, but still see some who are asking about, you know, the, in the next trade and, 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 tr and seeking help on the, the, the trade of the moment, the setup of the moment. What, you know, how can I long this? How can I short this? Blah, 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 blah. Valid questions, valid questions. But uh, my point ha this week has been, I don't know why I've struck, the, I've decided to talk about this point this week, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that I've, um, I've seen a lot of traders uh, miss the bone on for quite a long time, and that's this. You can spend your time dwelling about the trade you miss. You can spend your time, uh, and sometimes it's a valid thing to do, to spend your time focused on uh, the, the, the setup of the moment. You know, it, could there be a valid uh, setup to go long or short on the given current spirit at any point in time, say, in a given session or in the near future? You can also spend your time, and, I, and here's my preference, you can also spend your time planning for the next trade. That next trade might be the next day. It might be the next week. It might even be next month. And I'm pause for emphasis there. I'm pause for effect there. You should always be in the minds, at least I am, and, I, and maybe more, it will help more and more of you if you, did, if you thought this way. You should always be in the mind, have the mindset of, I am gathering intelligence. I kind of think like a military officer, if, for those of you who like the military analogies. You're always gathering intelligence. You're always gathering intelligence for the, the next strategic move, whatever that might be, you know, long the euro, short the pound, uh, whatever. Always got that intelligence. For me, that intelligence comes from price action, also comes from uh, the so-called fundies, the fundamentals, you know, news flow, what central banks are doing, what uh, these days what some government officials are doing or not doing, whatever. There, there's all sorts of uh, clues. And other markets are examples of those clues. I've been talking and yapping about the um, Italian bond yields. I've been blue in the face, and, you know, that was a clue that there was something maybe building on the euro, and it helped uh, uh, that plus the um, uh, the LCH clearnet raising margin requirements uh, sparked a big move on the euro, which uh, could be the uh, probably going to be the trade of the week. Anyway, so the the, the mindset I, I feel that more and more traders should adopt is gathering intelligence. So many traders think about you know in the moment, think about now, 
and don't think about uh, you know you gathering information they could use for a trade you know the next session the next day days from now so you hold that thought in your mind and uh, use that to sure to consider that as you uh, approach the trading day tomorrow the next day the next day you you may not be there may be a session where it's just nothing suits your eye nothing looks right nothing makes sense and when that's the case spend that time gathering intelligence even even in the case of this uh, short trade here uh, whether it was a short you, uh, if you took it during the uh, yesterday's Asian session as I did or if you took it during the early part of yesterday's London session even as the, even as the euro was dropping I was thinking that mindset gathering intelligence I want to see where the euro paused not only to help me manage the trade but also also to help me identify uh, areas of prospective support and resistance that can help me set up a trade the next day or maybe the you know days after. Can't emphasize that point enough. Just that, that whole idea of gathering intelligence because I don't know about you, but given the choice between uh, rushing rapidly to in, in the course of say five minutes, check all the charts you can, identify all the lines you can, all the prospective sources of support and resistance that I can when I feel like I'm under the gun versus Kind of, and think about it from a school analogy. Don't you like to prepare long? Well, of course, it's not human nature to do so, but it's it's much easier to take a test when you've studied over and over and again, prepared for it, as opposed to the uh, that late night cram session. Well, I don't like to cram when it comes to preparing for a trade. I want to be prepared. I want to be prepared. I want to know as much as I can in advance as to you know what uh, levels of support and resistance could come into play, and then. You know, and then see what could happen, you know, minutes, uh, you know, mi uh, hours even in advance before it comes together. And then this just become, becomes a matter of having the patience to wait. And uh, by the way, that's a whole nother challenge, uh, having the patience to wait. Uh, by nature, I still see a lot of traders who are very impatient, not only with, you know, patients waiting for the entry to come together, but once you've got the trade, holding on to it long enough to capitalize from it. So anyway, gathering intelligence was I thought was, was a I thought an important theme to um, to keep in mind, an important thing to do, even if you weren't part of the, the uh, short trade yesterday on the euro. So we talked about 36.60 area, talked about 36.25. Well, I've also got a line at 35.55 here, a horizontal a horizontal purple line 35.55. You can see it in the bottom of the chart that defined yesterday's New York morning session lows, and even looked during the New York afternoon. That was uh, seemed to after we after the euro broke below that area. That seemed to uh, uh, put a, a lid on some highs for him during the New York afternoon on this 15-minute chart. In fact, let's go to an hourly chart here. Now look at that. Look at that hourly chart on the right-hand side. Even on an hourly chart, maybe it's just me, but you can even tell on these hourly candles. How that 30, I call it the 3550 to 3560 area. You see how that area that seems to have influenced price action over and over and over again? What a set of interesting clues. So I, I'm actually having even gotten to the, the, the one of the first trades today on the euro, but I wanted to make that point of, you know, gathering intelligence, uh, it, it, again, starting with uh, yesterday's sell-off and how that could, uh, you know, bring together a prospective uh, trade on this, in this case, during today's New York morning session on the euro. So anyway, by the way, the uh, 35, uh, 50 to 60 area was uh, certainly the, a valid basis for a long during today's London session after the initial drop from 36.25 area, which I mentioned just earlier, was a temporary floor on the euro during the early part of yesterday's New York morning session. So interesting, let me go back to the 15-minute uh, chart and go to show price action during, uh, yeah, I want to go about right here. So again, yeah, this is the, the right, actually the view I definitely wanted to show. So you've got, you've got the, the evidence that the uh, this 35, 50-ish area was a floor during the New York morning session yesterday, ceiling during the New York afternoon, ceiling during yesterday, uh, today's Asian session, we break we break above that during early London session trading. Uh, find resistance temporarily at the 36.25 level, which I mentioned earlier was a temporary floor on during the euro sell-off yesterday during the early New York morning session. We dropped back down. What was 
support during yesterday's New York morning session, what was resistance during yesterday's New York afternoon, and today's uh, late Asian session became a floor again. So there was a case for a long round 3560-ish. Uh, and as I mentioned in, uh, in yesterday's New York session video review, that 3560 area was uh, important to the euro over several days in, uh, what was it, late September, late September. Now, you, you, do you have, remember that? No, but you know what? If you if you look at these charts enough, and if you uh, especially if you trade this enough, the cer certain price levels should you know you should retain in their memory. You, they should just they should ring a bell for you. They should sound familiar to you. And and you know if you if you're not to the point where they where they do, that's fine. But uh, you know keep putting the lines in your charts and your charts for uh, some days and sometimes can get pretty messy. They can get pretty messy. So uh, you know. You, it, it, sometimes for newer traders, it's a lot to take in. But I'm telling you, the more you do this over time, uh, especially if you, especially if you find ways to reinforce certain types of intelligence or data you collect, uh, the way I do it, uh, of course, you know, coaching has its benefits. One of the benefits is I actually, you know, have to talk about such things over and over and over again. It helps reinforce uh, my own memory of certain levels, and I record in New York session video reviews. Another source of reinforcement, one reinforcement that actually two different re sources of reinforcement each one of you can do to help you remember certain levels if that's what you're seeking to do. Uh, one, you should be keeping a trade journal. Journaling trades is, uh, is helpful. I would recommend this. In addition to journaling your own trades, journal the trade you didn't take but you wish you had would have. Has anyone ever tried that? Journaling the trade you didn't take but in retrospect, you're asking, you know, wonders, why didn't I take that? Have you ever thought of journaling that? You should. You should. I mean, try, document as best you can what you were doing at the time, you know, the, the reasons why you missed the trade. Now, sometimes they're very valid reasons. You, you know, the, the dog's begging you to, uh, to take you outside, to, to, to let it go outside for a walk or whatever. Or maybe the cat needs a bath. But uh, the, the, so many times, many times it's either you're distracted or you didn't see the clues that were in front of you. Especially if it's ladder, if you're distracted, or if, if it's something preventable, something you can address. You know, those are things worth documenting. Those are things worth acting on. Yeah, again, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Recording that. But folks, I'm telling you if, you, if you're looking for, you know, some secrets trading, well, you know, I don't know if I have any, uh, you know, magic pixie dust or secrets, but I mean, one of the keys to trading is you know, just constant, constant improvement. I come from a so-called, uh, from the so-called Six Sigma field. Anyone heard of Six Sigma? Six Sigma. Uh, but W. Edwards Deming popularized that movement, which uh, Japan really took hold of and helped. And it's one of the things that helped lift Japan out of um, its uh, post-World War II mess. And I have a master's degree in applied statistics, and I've been applying Six Sigma concepts uh, on and off throughout my uh, professional career. And, uh, you know, one of the, the main concepts there isn't so much, I mean, well, part of it is using um, statistical analysis methods and other means to identify, like, you know, root causes and, 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 and minimizing defects in the case of a manufacturing line. But, you know, the, 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 one of the bigger keys to it is just having a mindset, having a mindset of continually improving something, whether it's a, a uh, whether it's a, like a, a manufacturing machine making widgets, making fictional widgets, or improving your own skills. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I still have that feeling of, uh, I, 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 I've, at least I understand more now than I did uh, six months ago, a year ago, certainly th uh, three or four years ago, but I still have that feeling that I, I have more to learn. I saw that feeling I have more to learn, especially these days, given all the thing, all the new things that are going on, uh, some new policies pursued by different central banks, uh, Europe, I mean, Europe, in, in many ways, Europe is an uncharted territory. Folks, if you feel like you've got it all figured out, uh, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week or next month, but uh, you will be humbled. You will eventually be humbled if you have that uh, feeling you've got it figure, all figured out. Either A, you take some uh, trades, uh, that eventually just don't work because you're looking the wrong way when the market's go going the other way, or B, you get so um, so aggressive and or so confident that you over leverage yourself. Oh, damn you! Yell about. <clears throat> so yeah, Dan, I, the, 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 this, this is a good topic that I, I actually enjoy talking about, and I have several ideas along those lines, but. I may not have time to talk about this today, but uh, this is one of those things. Feel free to ask me about this in future webinars. 
uh, topics such as uh, discipline and, and psychology. And and it's not just me yapping about yeah yeah you got to do these things, folks. I live this, and I'm not I'm not saying this to brag. I'm not saying this to uh, to make any of you feel guilty about the thing how how the each of you live your lives, but I, I do live this. I do live this uh, from the distant perspective. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an avid exerciser. I, I work out three, or four, or five times a week. Number one, because I like, I like it, and I like the feeling it gives me. But number two, it actually, it's, it's almost a means of forced discipline. I mean, I, I, I find it myself, me personally, and how I'm wired. I find it more difficult to be um, a disciplined trader and yet be kind of. Uh, uh, carefree and and wheeling dealing sort of thing in other parts of my life, but that, I mean that's just me. That's just me. There's 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 certainly an aspect to trading where uh, it's almost a gambling part of it that, that, that folks uh, those who have a, a gambling or a risk taking sense you you, do, you need to have some of that. Don't get me wrong. You need to have some of that sense of of taking risk. If you're if you're ultra conservative, this can be a very di- a difficult thing to um, a, diff- a difficult endeavor to embrace. But I would argue this: even the uh, even the seasoned gamblers, those who do these uh, poker tournaments in, in, in Las Vegas and such, I mean, they understand things like probabilities. They they and I, I would argue most of them have they probably have their own degree of discipline that they apply to um, to their card playing. So anyway, I think I made a point about that. The thirty five, fifty to sixty area again, represented by the horizontal purple line here. Uh, before I get back to the next trade, so that was the, that was the long on the EURUSD during uh, during today's uh, London session, long around 35.60. Got that? Okay. There was a short which uh, I need to show you on a different chart. And actually, what I'm about to discuss may shock some of you. Make shocks to me. You're, you're so, so many, if you've been around my webinars for any length of time, you're so used to seeing charts without indicators, right? I mean, some of you are like, probably are like, you know, where are the stochastics? Where's the MACD? Where's the moving averages? I do go through these charts from time to time, but I, I actually addressed this. I actually mentioned this in my live, my live coaching session today. And I think I got, <laughs> I probably made a couple of, uh, our members fall out of our seats, of their seats too. But let me, uh, let me show you something here. Little pop quiz for you. Do you see a clue? Do any of you see a clue based on what I show on this chart right now? Price action plus stochastics. Are there any traditional clues? Yes, Dan, thank you. I knew at least one of you were sharp enough to catch that pretty quickly. Lower high in stochastics, higher high in price. Classic bearish uh, stochastics divergence there. Now that's a warning sign, nothing more but a warning sign that the uh, the rise there could be exhausting itself. Now, what I find interesting was that uh, if I go back to the, the other charts with indicators, look where the euro found itself during today's New York morning session. I'm looking at them. This is an hourly chart with uh, an hourly chart with daily pivot points. If you see my cursor near the top of this chart, you have the daily central pivot point. An hourly 55 EMA, the downward sloping blue line, that's an hourly 55 EMA. In this context, a perspective source of uh, dynamic resistance, sort of a moving, a, a potential moving ceiling for the euro. And, as I, as I just showed you on that 15 minute, oh, I should have mentioned the time frame, the chart I just showed you a minute ago, that's a 15 minute chart. You probably, maybe you saw the M, the M15 at the top, but in case you didn't, this is a 15 minute chart. 15 minute chart showing divergence. So, uh, divergence on a 15 minute chart, and by the way, mind you, stochastics on the hourly was overbought at the time. At, at two perspectives areas of resistance, the, uh, or sources of resistance, I guess I should say, the uh, daily central pivot point and the hourly 55. That was the case for a short, a short on the euro during today's New York morning session, right at, the, right at about the midpoint psychological level, 3650. 
Yes, I know the uh, daily central pivot point, at least as I have it, is close to the 34, 35. But it's anywhere in that region there, between 36.35, 36.50, a valid short on the euro. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to my other euro charts. Say, so, Solman, do you, do you uh, Solman, do you see today's price action uh, rise? Is that what you mean? That you, you said, uh, I see, Solman, uh, your comment about... Um, uh, Euro's going up is rather surprising. Are you talking about today's move being rather surprising? Or some other day? Today, not so surprising because member markets move in waves, but I can address that topic a little bit. But uh, I want to get back to this uh, chart with that indicators. Now, remember that 35, 50 to 60 zone we just talked about? Again, what was a floor during the New York morning session y yesterday, a uh, ceiling during the New York afternoon, a ceiling during today's Asian session, uh, and even uh, provided support for the euro on a dip during today's London session. Well, guess what? It became support again today during the latter part of the New York morning session. And there we go. That was the next trade on the euro. So short around 36.35, 36.50. Um, close that short. I know traders who went both ways, short and long, short and long. Now, why would you why would you even consider going either going both ways or being a, or think or having very short term thinking in your trading? Was well, I see it, and this is this this isn't always uh, easy to spot when um, the clues when this can happen. But as I see it, uh, after a big move like yesterday's move, actually the move down from yesterday's high to today's low, pretty big move historically. Pretty big move historically. And what's common after that is you get um, a, at least a retracement, often some so-called consolidation. So it, it's you know big move down, short covering in this case, profit taking, and then some chop chop uh, sort of like sideways price action for a while, maybe a day, maybe longer than a day. So we're, we're, we were in that phase today where it was um, uh, we, the move down from yesterday continued in early Asian session today. London session that was primarily profit taking, or maybe maybe a few bulls stepping in, and then uh, today's the New York morning session, sort of that consolidation phase where it's you know partly up, partly down, and again that's that's a that's a classic uh, a pattern of price action after a big move. So Solomon, there's there's your answer to your question. It's you know the the the, the yesterday's move was the move. The latest move, anyway, in response to events happening in the likes of uh, Italy, for example, today didn't have didn't have a whole lot, as I saw it, a whole lot to do with anything news-wise. Well, maybe you could cite, and uh, and I'll give credit, at least partial credit, to those who cite this. Uh, we, may, we may be ruined with a little bit of uncertainty in Greece. The uh, Greece apparently does have a prime minister now, so that could have been at least a, a small contributing factor. But Solman, you know, at the end of the day. I can't argue with the technicians who just say something like, hey, the euro is oversold. The euro is oversold and uh, markets move in waves, and so the day was more up than down. It happens, but not all that often that the, that the market just moves in a straight line for you know sessions and sessions and days and days and weeks and weeks. And uh, again, I'm, I've said the point uh, before already, and I'll say it. It's worth saying again because it's uh, it's something that, that even I'm reading about myself of. Uh, not just currencies, but even other markets tend to overshoot. Tend to overshoot, and you can make a case. Uh, you can likely make the case that, that yesterday's uh, sell-off a bit overdone, at least in the near term. Now, is that to say the euro is going to go to is not going to go to like uh, you know 1.30, 1.20, 1.10 eventually? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. Just that, you know, that the yesterday's move was it for now. So anyway, I recognize it's 1.30 p.m. 1.30 p.m. New York time. I've got about 15 minutes, minutes scheduled left. I wanted to get to the other currency pair because of, uh, especially because of the uh, the technical setup it provided. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, before I get to that, Ralph asked about a long after the failed new low of 3510. Ralph, you looking for the next long then? Plus rejection on 135. 
Let's, let's, let's talk about 35. Where's 35 at here? So this 135, oldest morning. <clears throat> Honestly, I didn't look at that myself. I'm not saying it isn't valid, I just didn't look at it. So I recall some of the fib levels that I, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, look at the, uh, the initial sell off in, uh, early September. That first major bounce was at, right at about 1.35. And that's been, I mean, that's what I would have looked to first. You know, is there a hist any history for 135? Yeah, it's a nice round number psychological level. But what else is going on there? You don't have any major fib levels nearby. There's to check, uh, Things like pivot points and such. I don't recall. Yeah, I, in fact, I, I should have known this was the case. Uh, when you have a big move, like you did yesterday on the euro, daily pivot points are so wide then, you, you, you can go through an entire trading day and never touch a significant daily pivot point. And that was the case today. So just to be clear, Ralph, uh, you know, it, it, was it a valid long? Yes. I, I would say a big basis for that long, around 1.35. If I recall correctly, let me go back to my euro chart here. If I recall correctly, that long came together at around the open of London session trading. So look at this, look at it from this perspective. You've got the 1.35 area. I mean, that, actually this setup, you see my crosshairs? That's that part right there. That's uh that's a valid long. That's a valid long. Right, you're right around London Open. Stokes already oversold and crossed up. And, uh, the 135 area having, as I mentioned earlier, having been important, uh, in September on the initial, uh, major sell-off on the euro. And your risk is minimal here. You got the low for the day at about 3480-ish, 3482. And I'm just guessing that's about a 78.6% fib of the initial rise up from today's low. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, Ralph, that's, that, that's a valid long. That's a valid long. But Ralph, I want to emphasize uh, the the the, um, the importance there of time of day, time of day. That's uh, that came together at around 3 a.m. New York time, basically the open of the London trading session. So the idea was that uh, you know Asia took the market one way, and by the way, it was you argue, you can argue that uh, Asia had the Asian session traders had not had their chance to sell off from the euro to sell the euro in response to yesterday's uh, uh, move by LCH ClearNet to raise margin requirements on Italian bonds. So, I mean, it, it, so, so Asia sort of extended the move that uh, London and New York had pushed on the euro. And then uh, you know, we, we find uh, you know, London session traders at the basically start of their, their training day find the euro at a prospective source of support, you know, 135 psychological level, which put a floor into the, uh, again, under the initial uh, September sell-off. Again, stochastics oversold and then crossed up. So yeah, and again, very, risk very well defined there. You know, again, you're long around 95 ish or so, it may, or maybe even a little lower. Get out if it makes a new low for the day. In fact, there was another one right there. That even that one wasn't that was fairly valid. Around uh, 35, 25 ish. You see that? Wasn't crazy to take that shot right there. <clears throat> well, I'm running a little short on time, so I, again, Ralph, uh, thanks for the question. I hope I addressed it. Yeah, totally valid. Uh, the other pair, does anyone guess the other pair? What's the other pair I might be looking to talk about? It's a pair I haven't talked about in a while. And I'm hoping some folks down under are attending here can, that's, who, who can appreciate my discussion of this pair. And that's a big clue. Folks down under. Let me gradually make my way over there. Yeah, the Aussie.
Wait, I'm just getting this Euro chart back to size. Okay, Aussie. I want to show you a daily chart, and we're gonna we're gonna put some pieces together here, pieces of a puzzle together. Uh, I'm gonna start with this. Now I'm gonna these what I'm gonna add some horizontal lines and trend lines and such. Uh, they're they're all, they're all gonna be the same color, although I don't uh, consider everything I'm adding. The, you know, I, I wouldn't normally make them all the same color and the same thickness. For those of you who don't know, I, I like to, um, in my live class, and you've probably seen it some here if you've attended in webinars in the past, I like to uh, give different perspective lines of support and resistance different emphasis. You know, lines that are more important to me are thicker and darker. Lines less important in my mind, in my subjective mind, are thinner and lighter. And sometimes I use different colors just to uh, be able to easily reference these lines in a, in a, in a webinar like this one. So there's one. I'm not sure this one's a um, a huge deal, but can you see the basis for the red line I just added? That sounds blondish. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gabe. I didn't mean to offend anybody by that. Or you, for that matter, I didn't mean it wasn't looking to make myself look stupid. <laughs> You know, all, in all seriousness, I, I am, I've been used, a, a big user of different colors and graphics for a long, long time in my, uh, my so-called previous life as a, as a Six Sigma consultant and, and, and statistician and quant, call me what you want. Uh, I, I found it very helpful, even to me, to, um, uh, represent the results of different analyses on graphs with different colors. You can go overboard with that. I don't like to go overboard with it, but, uh, you know, the emphasis of, uh, you know, colors and, and design and, uh, who's, um, who's, who, who, anyone ever heard the name Tufty? I don't know if I pronounced his uh, last name correctly. It's been a long time since I've referred to him. Edward Tufty. Edward Tufty. He's a, um, written a lot about, um, uh, design when it comes to graphics. Learned a lot from that guy. It, he's a, he's actually a, I've got a book on my bookshelf from him and I still, I can see it right now and I still refer to it from time to time. Edward Tufty. T-U-F-T-E. A very, you know, excellent, uh, He's done some excellent work on the on the um, on the art, if you will, of uh, graphic design. So anyway, there's one perspective trend line, and that's not the one of the main ones I want to emphasize. But you can argue that's one. I'm going to zoom in on a daily chart a little more, and I'm going to use some red arrows to highlight some higher lows there. And I'm, not, I'm by the way, I'm not done. I'm not done. There's a couple others over here too, on the, near the upper right-hand portion of, of the chart. See where I'm going with this? There's another trend line in there somewhere. Yes, Edward Tufty. I'm trying to see his book from where I sit. It's way over my bookshelf on the other side of the, uh, his, one of his main books that I have is, is titled The Visual Display of, of Quantitative Information. The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And let me post the uh, name. I'm pretty sure it's tough to you. So anyway, you should see my, uh, you should, so you should see a couple of trend lines there. And you know what, just just to make the point here, I think it's a point worth making. I'm going to make one a thinner line than the other one because I think the I think the red the, the initial red trend line I added was is a maybe a little more subjective and and also especially the, the the thinner red trend line that I added first covers a shorter span of time. The thicker red trend line covers a longer span of time. In fact, that trend line goes back to at least uh late last year. So we've got that going on. A couple of trend lines. Uh, the red one especially, note where that came together. About 1.0050. And there was one more thing. I believe it was a fib level here. A fib of the move up. Look at that. 50% fib of the what was pretty much the October rally on this pair. 
Notice how the uh, Euro USD and the Aussie USD rallied during most most of the month of October. The 50% fib of that move up is represented by a horizontal black line and about 1.0072. So here's what you got here, a trend line going back to at least late last year, a 50% fib. And, you know, if I tweak the thinner trend line, you know, trend lines are not actually subjective. Yeah, maybe there's no trend line in there as well. But especially the thicker red trend line and the 50% fib, totally valid case there for a long today on the on the Aussie. And by the way, that long came together about the same time as the Euro long came together, and, and both those came together at around the open of the London trading session. And get this. All right. Um, look, now I'm back to an hourly chart. Look at the lows from late last week. Looks like November 2nd, November 3rd low. I'm going to draw a horizontal line there. So I've got those lows. Got some price action. Uh, yet, was it yesterday? Remember, uh, so, so the euro saw off yesterday, so did the Aussie, broad dollar strength. See the hesitation there yesterday on the Aussie during that sell-off? That was a valid target for the long. So a long based primarily, not solely, but primarily on a, uh, a red trend line going back to late last year. That came together about the same time as a valid a Euro the USD long in the, in the early London session trading. Target for that move, for that uh, trade on the Aussie, the one, just, just above 1.02, the psychological level which seems to have had a notable influence on price action. Uh, bar some, bar can sell, bar cancel. <laughs> if I, if I mispronounce pronounce your nickname, I apologize. <laughs> I, I'm from the Midwestern U.S. and I have, I have, uh, uh, I've embarrassed myself many times with improper pronunciation of nicknames. So don't take it personally. I'm just not very good with those nicknames. Uh, possible head and shoulders on this pair. Bar cancel. Okay. What time frame? I, I know. I already know what you're talking. What you're talking about here. I see what you're talking about. It's it's fairly similar. I'm looking at a four-hour chart now. This is a, a somewhat similar uh, scenario though, as what we saw on the euro. We had a lengthy discussion about this yesterday. By the way, uh, FX Street. I recognize it's, it's uh, 1:45 p.m. New York time. It's scheduled to end time in my session. I will try to keep this short. I, I don't want to. Um, uh, um, Take an event, too much advantage of uh, your time or anyone else's time, but uh, I'll wrap this up as quickly as I possibly can. And thank you for your patience on that. Uh, so yeah, you, you said it's on daily chart. Well, you can see it on a four-hour chart here as well. Uh, we we discussed this yesterday in my live coaching session, and actually uh, during London session, Coach Christian Stevens' session, latter part of his session, he was discussing the same thing. We were discussing the uh, the apparent head and shoulders pattern on the Euro USD, but we have a similar pattern here. Here's my thought on that when it comes to any pattern, any pattern, head and shoulders, inverse head and shoulders, uh, I don't know, one, two, three pattern, you name the pattern. When it comes to these things, when it comes to these things, um, the more obvious, the better. The more obvious, the better. Oh, really, Erwin? Thank you for that. I didn't know that. That's, that's, a, that's a keeper. I'm going to check that out. Thank you. So... My perspective on this pattern you, that you suggest could be a head and shoulders pattern. You know, it's it could be, and I, I know a, a, a few traders and actually some uh, some prominent uh, forex analysts who have written about a similar pattern on the euro and say that it's a head and shoulders pattern. I won't argue with you or anyone else who claims that's a head and shoulders pattern. It, um, it it's not striking enough to me to call it head and shoulders. And maybe I'm more of a purist when it comes to head and shoulders patterns. I'll admit that. But uh, I, I'm looking for, when, when on a head and shoulders pattern, I'm looking for a more prominent left shoulder, more prominent right shoulder. And again, I, I, I maybe, sometimes I'm too perfect now. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, I'm looking for the perfect head and shoulders pattern. I, I get, uh, I can be uh, overly picky on that. I admit that. And I recognize that. And I try to uh, consider that when I look at patterns like this. So is it? Yeah. Well, here's another factor too. So from so first of all, let me let me clarify the first factor. This these are pretty weak shoulders for me to, to classify that as a as a head and shoulders or crown reversal pattern. 
That's one thing. Let me go to daily chart here. The second thing, for me, a classic head and shoulders trend reversal pattern, it, it, it defines the end of a lengthy trend. The end of a lengthy trend. Well, to me, the, the, the only trend, that, and I don't know if you really want to call that, the only trend was uh, a rise in the Aussie during the month of uh, September, or correction, month of October, month of October, which arguably, I, I, won't, I don't want to call that a trend. I want to call that more of a retracement, if anything, of the, uh, of the prior sell-off during the summer and the early fall. So here's my point. When it comes to head and shoulders patterns, and this, this is the way I was taught, and, and I know many other traders are thinking about the same way I do on this, the longer the trend, the more believable the head and shoulders pattern is. The longer the trend, the more believable. And I this. I'm, for me, this doesn't qualify as a long trend preceding that, that sort of head and shoulders pattern. So you said it's mislocated somewhat. So I, I, it sounds like you and I agree on. I mean, not that you have to agree with me on this. I, I know others who swear that this this one and this, a similar one on the Euro USD that that they're head and shoulders patterns. You know, I I don't think that way. I mean, could it be considered later reversal pattern? I mean, you know what? Let, let me. Here's what I think of first and foremost. Let me go. Let me go to a euro chart here. I'm going to go to a euro weekly chart. You can call, and it's, it's hard to see here. And I'll show it. Well, let me show it here. I got. I'm going to show you the daily chart so you can get the, some appreciation for what we're dealing with on the uh, euro. Same sort of thing on the euro here. By the way, I, I apologize. I got all kinds of errors on this, but you can probably see the makings of a head and shoulders like pattern on the euro here. Very similar to what we just saw on the uh, Aussie chart a bit ago. But the way I really think of this, I don't think of it so much as a head and shoulders pattern, but I think first and foremost, back to a discussion we had several, a few weeks ago about this trend line. As I see it, let me thicken up this thing up. The main trend, going back to, you know, about more than a year ago, the main trend was up. And we've broken that trend. Now the trend is, uh, could be down. So, you know, what I would find interesting is, you know, then, and, and we're, we're talking, folks, we're talking, you know, months ahead now. What I've found interesting is a, um, a drop of the euro down, back down to say 120, and then a big inverse head and shoulders pattern form there, maybe sometime next year or early, even earlier the year after. So when we're talking like a, a head and shoulders pattern on daily chart, that's what I would look for. Now again, you can see uh, similar head and shoulders patterns on shorter over shorter time frames, you know, an hourly chart and such. But when it comes to a head and when it comes to a head and pattern, a head and shoulders pattern, defining that on a daily chart, I um, I, I give a lot more scrutiny. I, it needs to be just blatantly obvious to me. Another thing to consider is this: um, you know, it, there's got to be the longer term the time frame for me, the more I consider the fundamentals of the, that are affecting the currency pair. I'm not saying patterns don't trade well. In fact, again, this this trend line retest I thought was beautiful uh, earlier the, or, or last month, late last month. That was a, a very viable, very viable technical setup uh, to look to short at the at the trend line retest. But in terms of, you know, what's, what's the, as I still see the primary driver, especially these days of the currency markets, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fundamentals, pure and simple. And it, it is, let me put it this way, I don't, I don't want to offend the technic, the, the, the pure technicians who, uh, who can cite, you know, plenty of viable cases where technicals, uh, work even on a, on a, a daily chart or a weekly chart. But let me just say this, I find it interesting how, um, and this is where some of the beautiful trades come together when technicals and fundamentals align. Does anyone know what I mean by that? What I mean by that? When technicals and fundamentals come together, that's that's the making using the makings for some of the best trades you will see, whether it's on a 15-minute chart or a daily chart or weekly chart. <clears throat> yeah, the highest probability trades when those two blend. Uh, Erwin, you still there? You were asking about special drawing rights er, er, earlier, Erwin. 
Uh, Erwin, I, you know, that's something, something I would, uh, concern yourself with right now. And this, by the way, is, I guess this applies to anyone who's, uh, curious about or interested in so-called special drawing rights. It's, uh, something, uh, conceded by the, uh, IMF and the, the, the International Monetary Fund back in the late 1960s. Even the IMF plays down the role and the meaning of the, of the special drawing rights. I, you know, I, and this is a, a short and very insufficient answer because I'm, I'm, I'm tested for time and I apologize I didn't carve in, Carve out enough time to address that, but uh, and I can address it more early next week in one of my webinars here, if uh, if need be, if you want to know more about that. But it, it's not something I am, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time uh, focusing on or, or or studying or worrying about yet. I mean, I, I, there's actually one of the things that our members a year, like a year or so ago, were asking about is could you know could something like special drawing rights become you know the world currency and could currency trading, could, 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 uh, currency trading go bye bye? Uh, it's possible someday. I don't think it's possible anytime soon. Yeah, so it, very little, very little relevance at this point. And, you know, especially when, uh, you know, I mean, think about Erwin. Think about the environment these days. These days, um, there's. When it comes to currencies and, and exchange rates, there's, there's so often winners and losers. And when, if, when, if it comes to adoption of a, you know, it, what if the world were to come to in our lifetime? I don't, I don't know, maybe for some of you, it would be different depending on how, uh, how old you are. But uh, think about the move from our current system, you know, currencies, world currencies, to a, a standard a single world currency. Do you think we're going to get there very quickly or without uh, a lot of haggling, a lot, without a lot of negotiation, without a lot of, uh, you know, summits and meetings and years and years of working things out? And, and you know, think about how much of the current global financial system is based on, uh, among other things, the, the dollar as the uh, reserve currency. I mean, I look back to, uh, I mean, obviously I wasn't living then, but I'm reading about it, you know, back in the days when the, the uh, British pound was the reserve currency for the world. I mean, that process of, of the world morphing from the British pound being the reserve currency to the dollar being, the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency, that didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen overnight. That was a gradual process over years. And, you know, if, if, if and when something, whether it's special drawing rights or some sort of new thing ever, ever is, uh, is put together or, or designed, it, it's going to take a lot, it'll take a while for it to happen, a long time for it to happen. And, it's not going to happen easily because when can you consider that, um, I mean, even in today's world right now, looking at exchange rates, uh, there's going to be plenty of winners and losers. And when it comes to, um, uh, you know, changing from the way the world is now to a, a new world involving, say, a global currency, if, there, if we ever do go to such thing, uh, the, it's the, the, the stronger economic powers. I mean, they're the ones going to have to decide what we, what, what's done or not. And so you got to look at it from the situation of, uh, you know, what's in for the likes of the U.S., for Europe, for for China, for Japan. You know, I, I can tell you what which of those countries are most likely to, to benefit from a uh, adoption of a global currency. Maybe just because their currency is currently so strong, maybe Japan, maybe Japan. But it, it's it's I'm I'm, I'm that's a gross oversimplification. Of you know what you know would Japan really go for the idea? I don't know. But you know, other than that, I mean, think, think about you know China. China's doing everything it can to uh, keep its uh, currency weak, and you know, seems to so, so see some modest interest in letting its currency appreciate over time. But I mean, to, to look at to look at in China, they're doing so very gradually, and you know, with intent. Or there's a there's a plan to that. They're 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 not they're not prepared or at least they, they've done so in the past they might do it again sometime in the future but so far that they're, they're looking at uh, you know more more measured changes in terms of their uh, currency exchange rate so when it comes to you know, big changes happening fast it's going to take something drastic for that to happen and you know right now at least for at least for now nothing drastic uh, on the horizon unless uh, Europe where it doesn't flow then who knows And Gan, you make the, probably the best point of all, and it's a very valid one. I mean, Europe is a classic example of a, uh, a system of, um, 
you know, trying to bring out different economies under a global uh, single currency. I mean, do you look at what the the origin of uh, these these woes in the southern countries? I mean, just the money flow. It was just it's all it got all screwed up. You got countries with you know different economies and different conditions with different um, you know wage rates and and different uh, com- levels of competitiveness and yada 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 all uh, put under one umbrella, given a, a blanket sort of uh, monetary policy. And it, yeah, you're right, it didn't work. It, it was, or should I should say, maybe not to defend, not to offend the Europeans, it has not worked yet. Maybe some are sort of trying to make it work, but it certainly hasn't worked that well. Uh, Michael Petnus, Michael Petnus wrote, wrote a recent article that uh, uh, describes, I think, in uh, very eloquently sums up, uh, you know, what happened in Europe. And uh, his article uh, it was a recent article on the, uh, I think, the Tuesday or yesterday's edition of the Financial Times. And if, he, if you can dig up uh, Michael Pettis, P-E-T-T-I-S, he's uh, his work, um, his writings on China, especially worth uh, worth tracking. But he he did write up a, a well written description of uh, kind of how Europe got to where it is today. And folks, with that again, I've taken a lot longer than I expected, but that's my fault, not yours. Uh, you asked the questions, I chose to answer them, and uh, my like answers are as, as classically uh, longer, very very wordy, very lengthy. But I hope that helps. And. So with that, uh, that ends my series of webinars for this week. Again, thank you to FX Street for making these events possible. Thanks to each one of you for your participation, for your, if nothing else, just lending me an ear. And uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers.